All right, perfect. Welcome, everyone. We're going to wait. We're having a couple of our panelists still join here uh, while they join. Hello, hi, Claire. Um, while everyone joins, uh, let's ask a little bit of an icebreaker question. So first, welcome. I'm Christopher Sebastian. We'll, we'll start the formal process in just a little bit of time. I'm also joined by our secretary, Ms. Susanna Cope, and a couple of our panelists right now who we, I will introduce more in depth shortly. Uh, but uh, icebreaker question. So which saint are you guys feeling particularly devoted to right now? Like what, what saint is really like re speaking to your spirituality? For me, it's St. Therese of Lisieux right now with her little way. I don't feel like I'm doing many great things, uh, but it's very consoling that in the little way of St. Therese, you can still approach greatness and greatness for uh, what God has planned for your life at this moment in time. Uh, Susanna, do you, do you have anyone that pops to mind for you? I think the spot. it's always the Therese's and Teresa's. So St. Therese, St. Teresa of Avila, and Mother Teresa. <laughs> awesome, awesome. I do sometimes feel Mother, Mother Teresa is always a good one. Uh, very, very good. Uh, Dr. Sullivan, how about you? Um, St. Catherine of Siena. I always go to St. Catherine. Yes. And then also teaching St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. St. Elizabeth Ann Seton. Very, very good. Love it. Love it. Uh, and St. Catherine of Siena, have you read the Sigurd Unset biography of her? No, but I've been recommended. Oh, okay. Well, count me as another. Recommender. recommender okay yeah. will do lenten reading <laughs> yeah lenten reading exactly um it is i mean i think it's one of the greatest biographies of a saint that i have ever read um i mean i also love sacred incident so so there we are uh miss janashek what do you have a saint that speaks to you particularly right now um yeah i you can hear me okay right no you sound great um yeah, so for me, it's been St. John of God, who I believe, so he's associated with like mental health and like awesome. healing and hospitalers. And I think he got me my internship. So I have a devotion awesome. to him. Yeah, I'm afraid of him. That's amazing. Um, I, I, there's always, I'm amazed to find the patron saints of things that I didn't realize have patron saints. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. patron saint of accountants has been something that, especially during tax season, praying to a lot. It was St. Matthew. I should say it's St. Matthew. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And Mrs. Guernsey. Hi, Paula. Hi, guys. Oh, um, well, recently I'm actually learning a lot about Philip Neary and um, and actually Vincent de Paul, too. So kind of both of them. But um, I was always curious about, well, like Vincent de Paul, like, oh, he helped poor people. Yeah. He helped poor people. And then reading his biography, learning like what a great administrator he was, was really amazing. Just like, oh, one of his skills was actually like delegating more than anything else because he's just assuming, oh, Vincent de Paul just walked the streets and handed out soup. But that's like really not what he did, but also taught the clergy and made sure that priests were not lazy and that um, that they knew their stuff. So kind of um, picking up a little devotion to um, Vincent de Paul, which is new for me. So. That is awesome. And he's, I have to say, he's a, he's a saint that I have frequently <laughs> taken for granted. Um, because he's just every every parish has St. Vincent de Paul Society, right. St. Vincent de yeah. Paul drop boxes, things of that nature. Right. Uh, and but that is so, really cool. So often he actually, whenever he needed help, he would just go to rich women and be like, okay, well, you guys aren't really living a Christian life. So give me all your money and make you feel better. <laughs> and they would, they would just like pour out their money. And so I'm <laughs> not a rich woman, but sometimes I think, okay, if I can't um, do what Vincent de Paul did, like, where can I give? Um, that is really good. I, there's a, um, there's a saint that I'm reading. Well, actually I should say he's not a saint. Um, but it's a book that a priest friend of that many of you all know, uh, Father Sebastian Walsh recommended to me. Um, in my role as director of advancement, I, fundraising is a is a large portion of my role. And this is a book called um, "They Call Me the Bacon Priest," and it's a very fascinating book because it's a a priest who, after World War II, would go around and fundraise for a lot of the people in Germany, the Catholics and, and Christians in Germany who were living in just the uh, 
worst conditions, just horrific conditions, and was mostly focused on bringing them the sacraments and whatnot, but was focused on, on a lot of things. And the really, really cool element of it is that he was, like you're saying, Paula, going to people that were wealthy and helping them live their lives and, and, and fulfill what God is calling them to do with their time, talent, and treasure. So I'm still in the middle of it. It's, it's a tougher read, but it's very fascinating, I think, um, to see, like, that's the hardest case for support that you can make, especially after World War II, helping the German people. Mm-hmm. But all right, also awesome. welcome. Okay, so so we have our couple of other panelists who just topped on, Mr. Tom Anderson and Mrs. Pamela King and Mrs. Grace Michael. Uh, well, I think let's get started then because we've got everybody here. Um, welcome everybody. Uh, we are so grateful to all of our panelists for joining here today. We've got a packed screen. It's excellent. Um, so today we are going to be talking about education and psychology. Um, first of all, we are so grateful to be joined by Miss Pamela King. Uh, she is a MODG alumnus, class of 2006, and an MODG teacher. Um, and she has also had a great variety of experience in educational uh, and institutions of a wide variety. Uh, she has her bachelor's in element, elementary education from Salisbury University in Maryland, and a master's in teaching English as a second language, ESL, uh, from Wilmington University. And she taught high school English as a second language and also kindergarten in public schools for 10 years, I believe it was, Pam. So a, a decade of experience there um, and has taught for us since 2007. Uh, and she also is really involved in her parish uh, at and the diocesan uh, ministry and teaching theology of the body and uh, a lot of other courses for, for adults. So thanks so much for being here, Pam. We are also joined by Mr. Tom Anderson, a former student of mine and an MODG graduate of 20, 2015. It seems like just yesterday, right, Tom? Uh, he and his wife just got married earlier this year and I are expecting their first baby, so congratulations. Um, Mr. Anderson has his bachelor's from Christendom in philosophy, and he has taught for a variety of, of subjects and institutions as, a, uh, as an elementary, middle school, and high school teacher. Um, and is also now the Dean and Guide at John Paul the Great Montessori Academy. Um, so we're really interested to hear his perspectives as uh, something, Montessori is fantastic and something that we'd love here. All right, uh, Mrs. Grace Michael, uh, thanks for being with us, Grace. Uh, you guys might recognize she is Mr. Bernard Michael's wife from our last webinar. Uh, she is a dear friend of ours, the principal at St. Sebastian uh, School. It's no, no relation to me, although maybe they'll name schools after me in, in one day. Um, she has taught for Our Lady of Guadalupe School, which is in our local area as well, for three years. And while she was getting her master's, master in elementary education, mastery, I think, too, it, it speaks. Uh, and she has been, Grace, when, how long have you been the elementary middle school principal? It's been a long time now. Yes, I'm in a year eight now. Year eight. Amazing. We're getting close on a decade. Spectacular. And she's done great things. Uh, hopefully, I don't know if Ambrose, baby Ambrose is, is there in the room with you, um, but she is also a working mother. So thanks so much for being with us and taking the time out of your day, Grace. Definitely. Okay. And now uh, we were hearing from Mrs. Paula Guernsey as well. She is our deputy principal in charge of learning support. She is also an MODG alumna, class of 2000, class of 2007. Is that right, Paula? She is a TAC graduate as well. She has worked for our school since 2020. 12 uh, and has done everything from being our receptionist to teaching pretty much every subject that we teach, uh, that we offer. Um, and she has uh, been the deputy principal for several years now um, and also has served on several committees for a lot of the organization or organizational elements for school. So thanks so much for being with us today, Mrs. Grinsey. All uh, right, and to my left, although I don't know if the screens are arranged in the same way for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Uh, somewhere in one direction is uh, Dr. Kathleen Sullivan. Uh, she is a professor at Christendom College. Uh, she graduated from Thomas Aquinas College. I, was it 2006, Kathleen? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm always trying to remember the classes. Um, and then went on to receive her master's from University of Dallas in the Department of English. She has a wide variety of certificates and accomplishments. Your PhD is from Catholic University of America in DC. And I believe her dissertation was on the importance of letters and literature. I don't know the exact title, but it is awesome. 
enough. And we talk about it all the time. And yeah. she she also loves Jane Austen. Uh, shocker. Uh, so so that, that's why we get along so well. Um, thanks so much for being with us today, Dr. Sullivan. And last but certainly not least, we've got Miss Claire Janoshek, who is also an alumna of MODG, class of uh, 2011, I believe, two years after me. Uh, she is a TAC grad as well. And she has worked for MODG immediately after graduating. I think that was 2015, Claire, is that right? Or we're just going over the history of everybody. Um, and since uh, in, in 2018, she has been taking classes with Divine Mercy University uh, for the completion of the Master's of Science in Counseling. And she is in her practicum here in Southern California at uh, outpatient, outpatient Program for drug, drug and Alcohol Use. So she'll be speaking with us today about counseling and psychology and therapy. All right, well, thank you guys so much. I'm going to toss it over to Miss Susanna Cope, our, our secretary. Uh, actually, I should start us off with a prayer. All right, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, amen. Our Mother of Divine Grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all so much. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Sebastian. I'm so thankful to have all you guys with us today. Uh, to start us off, Mrs. Guernsey, um, having had years of experience as a teacher and substitute teacher for a variety of subjects for Maj, how would you describe the importance of teaching every subject from a Catholic point of view, from religion and history to science and math? Yeah, Susanna, thanks for asking that. I was, um, I think that as Catholics, we have this really beautiful, unique perspective of what um, our Father Lau in the Faith and Morality book calls um, Christian optimism, right? And it's this idea of divine providence, this truth of divine providence that um, that God's care for the world extends to little things and big things. And we see that in every subject, right? And so it's going to be Sometimes that when you're teaching history, you can look at it from a really big angle. It's like, God, Jesus is the author of history. This is how it played out. Let's get the facts. Let's learn it. But understand that he is taking everything for the good. Um, and when you teach other things, even like, you know, jump into substitute, need teach math or something, you might not bring um, a Christian um, <laughs> examples into every every math lesson that you bring up but you're still you're still teaching from the perspective that god has made the universe and this is a good thing and it makes sense because he made it and i think it's it's paramount to know for the students to know yes like every subject makes sense because god has made it this way and it's it's gorgeous to be able to share that with students again sometimes it's not overt sometimes it's not going to be very explicit in every single class but still bringing that there I um, recently have just had a lot of time to reflect on what's called Christian optimism right again not just like oh it's okay because whatever happens is fine not this chill outlook on the world because not everything is fine but knowing that even the things that are really tough, God is allowing to happen for some good. And we might not know what it is that we might not never know till heaven, right? Or till um, the last judgment, but still some, God is allowing this for some good. And um, in my own life, things have been happening that are like, I don't understand that, but I know God must be allowing this. And so being able to present that to students and share that with students is really unique. That's something we can do as Catholic educators. So Susanna, that's what's been on um, my mind lately when I bring up the different subjects that I teach, um, even if it's, again, not explicitly um, theology, just being able to bring that perspective into the classroom has been um, huge. Thank you so much. That's really beautiful and definitely really important. We need to ask a similar question for the field of psychology. Um, Ms. Janaszek, what does bringing the Catholic faith into counseling mean to you? And why did you decide to pursue your master's in counseling after graduating from TAC? Yeah, so I guess to answer your second question first, it was a bit of a surprise to me and providential that I ended up doing the program. But I did for a long time, I wanted to be a nurse. My older brothers are doctors. And so there was kind of this family culture toward the healing and the helping professions. And um, 
So I was kind of inclined that way for a long time. And then it's been beautiful to see how counseling kind of integrates a lot of my loves in unexpected ways, which is often how God works. But um, as far as bringing the faith into it, I currently, in my limited experience, I do it kind of implicitly because it's not a like Catholic organization where I'm at. But um, I think accompanying someone while they're suffering and encouraging them to hope are very Christ-like things. And I think like having this lens from my faith and from my education, um, I can see hope and virtue and goodness in clients like more easily than I would otherwise. <clears throat> so I think with clients, even though they're not like Catholic and it's not a Catholic organization, I have talked about like spirituality and God and prayer and relationship and um, like virtues that I see, the need for self gift, all these things with clients. And I think that's kind of the way that I do it currently is in a more implicit way. And then I hope to do it more explicitly in the future. No, oh, thank you for sharing that. That's really beautiful as well. I'm sure it really makes a difference in their lives too. Yeah. All right, so to kind of move into the different types of educational settings, um, I'd like to start first with Ms. King. As Mr. Sebastian mentioned, um, you've taught not only for Maj, but also for both kindergartners and high schoolers at public schools in your area for many years. Um, I was wondering if you could just describe your experience of working at public schools and the importance of bringing the faith into your teaching in that setting, and then just what you like best about both environments. Sure. Sure. Um, so my first job in um, as a teacher in public schools was um, English as a second language and my degrees in elementary education. So that's not um, uh, a, a field in education that I thought I would be working in, but I, I absolutely loved it um, because you got to walk with students in such a personal way. And I think kind of along the same lines, um, of what Claire was saying, even though the public school system is not um, inherently Catholic and, um, you know, you may not be explicitly teaching religion every day, um, you still have the chance to um, <clears throat> look at each student as uh, a gift and uh, a beautiful opportunity to form the whole person. So um, I always knew I wanted to be a teacher. Um, English as a second language was um, uh, uh, a, a challenge for me, but it was a, a good challenge. I got um, students from all around the world um, and I got to walk with them throughout their time of um, acquiring language in, um, in school. So I got to have them year after year and oftentimes whole families would come in. So I got to meet their siblings and um, it was great. And uh, I think the ways to incorporate the faith specifically into that arena, um, I, I prayed for my students. I actually grew very close to Our Lady Guadalupe during this time because um, many of my students were from um, a Hispanic culture and background. Um, <clears throat> and I think if you are going to work in that setting um, where, um, let's say, you can't explicitly um, teach the faith, uh, it's important to stay rooted in a strong prayer life um, and to tap into good, um, you know, good spiritual food or <laughs> wherever that may be. But um, yeah, it's just teaching as a ministry, right? It's, it, um, you're just, you're forming a person and that's a beautiful, beautiful gift and it's a privilege. Um, then um, four years later, I found myself teaching kindergarten, um, which was a whole different experience, um, but but kids, there, there are some commonalities of, about kids. Um, they they are similar across ages in a lot of ways. But um, in kindergarten, I just love their joy for all of the seasons. And um, one specific example would be um, at Christmas time. You know, in the, in the public school system, we're encouraged to to teach um, all of the cultures around the world. And um, it just so happened I was able to like make an advent wreath with them and make a St. Lucy crown and um, celebrate St. Nicholas Day because we have such a rich um, cultural um, background as Catholics as well. So, um, and, and in kindergarten, they're learning social skills. 
very specifically. So you get um, such a unique opportunity to teach them how to relate to one another uh, kindly. And um, again, not overtly Catholic things in my classroom, but um, <clears throat> there are still a lot of things that we can bring as Catholics to the table in any profession and job in the way that, you know, I, I relate it with my coworkers and um, being, um, trying to, to be a good teacher in the best way that I can. And um, yeah, kindergarten, there's a lot of discipline, there's a lot of social skills. And I always tried to bring, um, uh, recognize the dignity of the person in disciplining my students as well, you know? Um, so, yep, that's what I would say. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. That's awesome and really beneficial, I think, for students who are interested in working in that kind of setting. So thank you. Yeah. All right, as Mr. Sebastian mentioned earlier, um, Mr. Anderson, you're the Dean and Guide at a Montessori school. I was wondering if you could explain the Montessori method, maybe to people who aren't as familiar with it, and then just your experience working as a Dean there as well. Sure. Um, that's actually my part-time job is explaining to people what the Montessori actually is, or at least it feels like it ought to be, because uh, so many people will ask, like, what actually is Montessori? Um, and the problem with that question is, is uh, there's really not one answer to it. Um, Montes Maria Montessori uh, herself, she was an educator and she was a brilliant, brilliant teacher. Um, but uh, she really set down a set of principles rather than a uh, uh, actual like step-by-step -step process of how to run a school. Um, so Montessori schools, depending on where you go, will, will all look kind of different. Um, but one thing that they all have in common is they have uh, uh, three, three environments. Um, I think that's probably the best way to approach it is by first looking at the environments and then seeing maybe more how uh, the actual method plays out. Um, so uh, the three environments that the school uh, is kind of divided into is uh, the primary, the elementary, and the upper. Um, at least that's how we, we call it in America. I mean, other countries will use other things. Maria Montessori herself was Italian. I don't know what the Italian words for them were. Um, but the primary school consists of uh, kids that, you know, they can come in as early as three or four, um, and then they usually leave there around six. Um, six or so. Some leave a little earlier, some leave a little later. Um, and then the elementary school uh, consists of those kids from uh, around six, six years old to about 12 years old. Um, so it's kind of very similar to, uh, to homeschooling is that nobody really knows what, what grade they're in. Um, uh, there's years you've been in the Montessori program. So you might say, I'm a six year, I've been in the elementary school for six years. Um, and, uh, and that's kind of how, how uh, that's broken up. And then the upper school consists of those kids. So basically like 13 year olds up to high school. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, graduate around 18 or so. Um, and then the method that it generally follows uh, is very, also very similar to, to homeschooling. Um, students have a, a work plan. They have an idea of what they need to get done. And then it's kind of up to them to get it done. So they're all in this one, one big environment, if they're primary, primary, if they're elementary, elementary, et cetera. And, um, and they, they know what they need to get done. And then, and then it's up to them to go do it. Every once in a while, they'll have a lesson on, uh, on how to do it, um, how to do whatever uh, tasks they have to get done. And then, um, and they receive that lesson and then they have the tools they need to finish that lesson and and go do it so to put it in a practical uh a specific example um for example math they have a math lesson every day uh i'm one of the math teachers so uh so i give them uh, i'll gather them around and say like all right uh kids in the six years um come come gather around on this rug i'll give them my my uh my math lesson for the day and then they'll have a certain amount of math pages that they have to get done for that day and they do it. Um, so there's not really a rigid like uh, time structure or anything like that. They have to manage their own time. And uh, that's one of the things that I think is really great about the Montessori program is students can kind of work on their own time and learn to manage their own time, uh, very similar to, to, uh, to homeschooling. 
Um, and then my role, uh, as I said, I'm a math teacher, but I'm also a writing teacher. So I give a, a writing lesson once a week. So uh, we use IW. I think M Mother Divine Grace still uses IW, maybe. Um, at least I did when I was when I was there. Um, so uh, so I'll give my my lesson and I'll teach them a new dress up. Um, so maybe it's the LY adverb and I'll tell them about the LY adverb, tell them they need to put the LY adverb in each one of their paragraphs. And then, uh, then I give them the source text that they're supposed to write from. And then they, they go write their stories next week. They bring it in and, uh, I say, good job. And we rinse and repeat. Um, so that's kind of how, how it runs. Um, it's very, uh, very hands-off. Uh, if a kid needs help, then obviously he can come to one of the guides that are in the room. And I think that's one of the other really uh, awesome benefits of Montessori is uh, it can be incredibly personalized because the students are getting a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention depending on what they need. And, uh, and I, I think that's, a, that's as concise a definition of Montessori as I can give. No, oh, thank you so much. That's really fascinating to see the differences and similarities between that and homeschooling. So thank you. All right, let's see, Mrs. Michael, I know you've been a teacher and now principal of St. Sebastian School. Could you tell us a little about your job as the principal, um, what it's like to work in a Catholic school setting and maybe your favorite and least favorite things about it? Absolutely, yeah. Um, working in a Catholic school sweat setting is definitely a blessing um, that you're able to come into the program, come into the school with a common understanding of what, what you're allowed to talk about. and. Um, that that's actually an expectation. You're able to, to come in with this idea that everybody is here because they want this Catholic education. So I'm here and my role is to help develop the faith of those who are here to learn. And so that's uh, a true blessing to be able to come and say, I'm helping these little minds grow. I'm helping these little bodies grow. I'm helping everybody here grow, but I also get to help their soul. I get to help their faith. And so, um, there's a wonderful aspect of being able to be co-workers with your fellow teachers and your fellow people here at the school who's, who feel the, the mission of that and that you're all in it because you are excited to help these little minds grow towards Christ. And so that gives uh, a real feeling of purpose to what you're doing. And it, um, it makes for a setting where everybody is feeling that sense of uh, development and goodness. And uh, so that makes a wonderful community as well. You, know, you get to grow your school as a school family and truly feel that, that bond of community because everyone has that common ground that you're sharing in your faith. You're here because you want this education, you want this faith. And um, so we get to talk with our parents about truly partnering with them for the education of their child that um, you know it's not being delegated to us. We're not taking over teaching their children. They are a partner with us in this. We are all one school family and we're growing towards that in general. Um, so that makes for uh, just a, a wonderful employment setting, a wonderful uh, set of coworkers and just a good school community that you're in. Uh, you know, there's always hardships that come with that. Uh, Christ did say that you'll be persecuted in my name. And a, a small persecution is that our society isn't really set up to be supportive in all the ways of our Catholic schools. So funding looks different for Catholic schools than it does for other schools. And uh, so it makes us underdogs in a lot of ways, but you know, everybody loves a good underdog story, right? So we get to spend our time uh, not only building and growing these kids, but also trying to find ways that how do we grow in spite of it all? How do we continue to, to take our community and make it even better in spite of not having this particular funding that we might need? Where can we get it? Let's get creative. And that, that also helps build creative thinkers and uh, critical thinkers because we have to always be thinking of how can we do this even uh, without all of the resources we might need. Thank you so much. That's really good to hear and very positive way to look at it. So thank you. All right, last but not least, Dr. Sullivan, having a wide variety of experience in the field of education, could you please tell us um, about your experience teaching college level courses at Christendom and about the ups and downs of teaching at a college as opposed to your experience teaching at a high school or a middle school? Yeah, sure, thanks. 
Um, I love it, first of all. Yeah, teaching at Kristen in particular, just like Grace was saying, um, as a Catholic college, you just have the freedom to be able to look at these works through the eyes of faith. And that is something that I'm so grateful for. And in college in particular, two main benefits, and they kind of go side to side. Uh, you have alternating days for your courses. So it gives you more time to delve into your work if you're not cut up with all your other extracurriculars and sports and whatnot. And you have more time in the classroom to go deep. And that's what I really love about Christendom in particular with literature, because at TAC, we maybe had two, maybe only one seminar class on Emma. It was probably two for Jane Austen's Emma or, or same with, with War and Peace. And, you know, they're, there's so much to say. And now I can take an entire semester and just talk about Jane Austen. And that's amazing and very exciting. So you have um, that, that depth that you can do in college. And then also it's really cool. Um, yeah, like I said, the alternating days, that schedule is great. Um, but at Christendom Liberal Arts, you know, you're, you're talking about literature and bringing up ideas of philosophy and theology and um, economics even. And so um, having that integration is just really cool to see when the students themselves are like, we just talked about this in philosophy class. And I'm like, I know, <laughs> liberal arts. <laughs> So um, it's, it's just, it's really, it's really wonderful. So lots of ups. Um, the downs is, it's kind of like the, the others on the panel were speaking of, um, I do miss the fact that because we are in college and, you know, you're living as adults and it's more independent, um, there's not so much of the family atmosphere on campus, apart from Sunday mass when the, when the um, families that live nearby can come with the kids. And I missed that. And I didn't really realize it until I went back and I um, visited uh, the high school I was teaching at before Christendom, and they were having a all day event where they a St. Cecilia's Day event, where the upper school students, they're all divided into their houses, they're each doing talent shows or skits and it would just struck me as so beautiful this one um, skit of the, the junior high girl, uh, like a seventh grader was reciting a poem with a second grader. And the little girl just kept looking up at the older girl the whole time. And that, it was just beautiful to see that kind of mentorship where the older students are around the younger students. The younger students look up to the older students. You see the moms and dad dropping off the kids every morning, picking them up, going to their games. Um, you know, we still have we still have a community on campus, and I love it. But there's um, there's just something beautiful about middle school and high school that I didn't realize I missed, which was having all the families there, kind of constantly every day and at all their activities. So, so that's one of the things I missed. But you you get a little bit of it on Sunday masses and like um, like St. Joseph's Day, the families are invited, and St. Patrick's Day. So that's all fun. But yeah. Oh, thank you so much. That's really good to know as well. Something I hadn't thought of. So thank you. Mrs. Guernsey, to come back to you, could you please describe your experience as the deputy principal of Maj? And could you tell us about the pros and cons of working and teaching for an online school, especially as a mother of two? Yeah, sure. So working at an online school, I think this is going to be true of um most online jobs, but we have this incredible community as well. But unlike what, you know, Dr. Sullivan and Mrs. Michael were saying, we don't have the in-person. And so our community has to morph a little bit, like how are we gonna do this? And how are we gonna bond? You know, you can't walk into the hall and bump into a teacher and say, hey, I'm teaching a religion class and my students had this question, what do you think? Let's talk about it over lunch. So instead you kind of have to morph our um, style of doing that at an online school, right? Saying, great, let's use some, it's like we use Slack. And so uh, like the teachers will post there, it's really active. So a teacher will say, this came up in my classroom. Do you have any ideas? And then all the other teachers in ninth grade will comment, but you'll even get you know, the 12th grade teachers or the seventh grade teachers and, um, so there's actually a room for a lot of camaraderie online. Um, working online, 
as a mom, this, this can be challenging. Remember, as a mom, a stay-at-home mom, it can be a little, a lot of times people say it's really lonely, right? Because you're with your kids and they, <laughs> you talk to them, they don't really talk back that much. And so having this beautiful um, place to continue to grow my mind and to have these deep friendships is amazing because it's like, actually, I've been working with these people for 10 years and like we have these really good um it's really strong community of teachers, but not only the teachers, but the families as well, because it's an online school that even when families move or move internationally or, you know, they're because we're K through 12, it's like, oh, um, if I taught beginning Latin in second grade and then I go and teach like 10th grade history, I might have siblings and even that widespread. So you have there's some those are really some of the perks of the online school part. Working as a deputy principal in the online is really cool because, again, um, just networking with so many colleagues al- around the U.S. and learning to um, and learning their skills, learning about them, and getting to know them has been really, really fun as a deputy principal. So there's some tough parts that come along with it, right? Student um, student <laughs> discipline will fall sometimes into my um, into my desk. Not every day. We have good students, but um, those sorts of things might be some of the challenges. And working as a mom, I'll add, um, again, having the online setting is just so amazing to be home with them and to be able to work my schedule around them and around my husband's schedule. So what is, what is he doing? You know, there were times where his, his job has changed a couple of times, but there were times where he could be home, you know, most afternoon so I'd set my schedule for the afternoon or evening when the kids are in bed other times where he'd need to be working later or work or away from home for a bit and so morphing that and having that opportunity in Mother Divine Grace is just incredible um being there with the kids is really fun but then also having a place where I can continue to grow professionally and personally and to keep a lot of friendships up has been really fabulous so I think um you know, the pros and cons are mostly all pros, <laughs> um, you know, and that and the cons that we've come up across, we found really good ways to bridge them. Things like Slack, where it's like, oh, well, I can't, I can't just um, you know, rub shoulders with a student, with, with a student, but we have all these different things and things like this, that, you know, it's like, this is amazing able to do this. Again, it's in modern day America, it's a little bit more common to do these Zoom meetings, but still in an online school for us, it's very natural, right? Where it's just like, this is what everybody's, this is what we're used to. And so um, students, I I hope, (laughs) find it easy. It's not a big transition. So those are some pros and cons that I've experienced. Thank you so much. That's really helpful and really great to know. There's so many pro- pros to it as well. Um, let's see. All right, Ms. Yanishik, could you tell us about your experience in counseling from the program that you're currently in and about the type of counseling that you're hoping to go to after graduating? Yeah, so I'm at Divine Mercy University, like uh, Chris mentioned, and I have really loved the program. It's been challenging at times, but I do think now that I'm in my internship, um, I can see that it has prepared me, I think, really well for the work. And I've always been impressed with the classmates and professors. I think they're all really excellent. Um, so yeah, it's kind of hard to like pick out exactly, yeah, specifics, but it's just, I yeah, do really appreciate the program and I think it's prepared me well. Um, as far as what I want to go into, I think I've kind of always wanted to work with children. And so I, down the road, I'd like to learn some more like models that would, that are for working with children. And then I think there is a need for Catholic therapists. So I might have a, um, opportunity to work in a private practice. And those are kind of the two things I have in mind. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, For the last like section before the Q&A, I usually just ask each of the panelists what advice they'd give to students who are interested in following a similar career path. Um, So to start off with Miss King, uh, what is some advice you would give to those who are interested in teaching, perhaps particularly for the public school setting? I know you had touched on that a little bit earlier. Sure. Um, I would say 
a, a large part of teaching is um, hands-on experience with kids and in different settings. So um, at, at your all's age uh, in high school, I would just jump into whatever situations um, that presented themselves to um, have an opportunity to be hands-on with kids in a classroom setting. So like for me, I know I started helping with um, religious ed um, as early as ninth grade or age 15 or something like that at my parish. <clears throat> and I helped in the kindergarten classroom for several years. Um, and I um, directed vacation Bible school and, and things like that. So um, just hands-on experience is really helpful. Yes, you need degrees and teaching certificates, but um, so much of teaching is learned through real interaction with um, students. Thank you so much, Ms. King. Mrs. Michael, how about you? What, do you have any tips you give to students who want to teach at work, maybe particularly in a Catholic school setting? So I definitely want to follow up on what Ms. King just said is um, that hands-on experience and learning how to interact with different age levels um, because uh, teaching is being able to uh, explain the topics so that the mind that you're working with can understand it. So whether it's talking to a, a little child or whether it's talking to a high schooler, you know, you've got different age levels and even all the way up to college, you know, we've got all these different levels that we have to be able to talk to um, and not only that, but different types of minds, you know, there's the hands-on learner, there's the visual learner, there's the, the one who learns through hearing. So being able to teach in uh, your, your item, your, your topic in multiple different ways. Um, and that comes, like Ms. King was saying, through experience. Um, when you go for degrees, you're learning, a lot of what you're learning is uh, the educational terms for, for everything, but without that hands-on experience, that won't necessarily stick in the best way for you. So if, you could able, if you're able to go in and get your degrees and say, I remember seeing that when I was working in this religious ed group, this child needed to learn it this way and Johnny too over here needed to learn it this way. Or I remember helping in that kindergarten classroom and I saw the teacher uh, teaching with her words and then also pulling out toys that the kids could learn that lesson with. Um, so being able to have those experiences so that you can link what you're learning in your degree with what you've seen, done, or heard of. Um, and even just talking with teachers and saying, how would you teach something like this? How do you teach someone like this? What are some of your best teaching stories? Because even through hearing their stories, you start to hear examples of how to teach. And those all stick with you so that when you're in your own uh, experiences of it, you can say, I remember hearing about this teacher who taught it this way. I remember hearing about a teacher who taught this lesson and did that. And uh, that just builds your arsenal of tools that you can take into a classroom with you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Michael. That's really helpful too. Um, Dr. Sullivan, what is some advice that you would give to those who want to be teachers, maybe especially um, for teaching at the college level? Yeah, same, same as before, you have to get into the classroom. Um, so between master's and doctorate, I wasn't quite sure if I had wanted to continue on for the doctorate. So I taught at the grammar school. I was there for a year. And it was so, it was so tough, <laughs> like, God bless our, our teachers, it was such a growing year. Um, and I, and I, and just like Grace was saying, you have to be in the classroom to kind of understand what it is that you, that you desire to do and understanding what we learned in grad school um, takes on a whole new meeting when you're in front of 20, 30, or even five or 10 um, individuals of various backgrounds, of various experiences, and how do I convey what I've been given to each of these individuals in front of me? It's, it's, I don't know how to describe it. So fellow teachers, you could describe it, but it is, it is uh, really wonderful and terrifying at the same time. Um, so that, yeah, taking time off in between the degrees uh, was really something that I highly recommend um, anybody who wants to pursue teaching at a college level um, and just kind of seeing, you know, what other opportunities, what other doors are open because uh, pursuing the PhD is, is 
very time consuming, obviously. And it also unfortunately gets quite solitary because writing a dissertation is, is something that only you have to do by yourself. And I much preferred being in the classroom. So it took me way longer than maybe others, but, um, but yeah, you, you need to, especially if you want to teach, um, as soon as you can get into any classroom, be it kindergarten or subbing somewhere else, um, I think that's what's essential. Thank you so much, Dr. Sullivan. Hey, Mrs. Guernsey, what are some tips that you would give to those who are interested in teaching for an online school or maybe particularly for Maj? <laughs> yeah. Um... Some of this, well, I would really say to, to, um, to network, to look at who do I know that does this and would they be willing to talk to me? So Mother Divine Grace, you have a great, <laughs> because you are Mother Divine Grace students here, you have the opportunity to talk to your teachers and say, hey, would you talk to me 10 minutes after class? I want to be an online teacher. I'd love to hear your experience. What you're doing today is another brilliant way to get about that, right? To collect several educators and and get their opinions and, and listen to whether they enjoy it or what they like about it. Because sometimes you want a career and then you start hearing about it. And you're like, oh, I actually didn't want that. I just thought it would be different. So definitely talking to people who are online teachers and everyone is willing to help the next um, generation. Like that's really, especially teachers who have such a heart for, um, for their students would love to meet with you in some way, whether it's, you know, 10 minutes on the phone, whether it's let's go out for some coffee, whether it's stay after class for a few minutes or even just an email. And to do that sort of mentoring and um, networking. So everyone else has mentioned, you know, being in the online or sorry, being in the, the classroom and getting that experience, which is really good. But I would add to that having having a mentor. So someone that you can come to and ask these questions to, um, you know, and many teachers are very, very open to that. Most professionals are, but teachers also will be very willing to talk to you about their their experiences and give some advice or listen to your questions or what you're wanting to pursue, whether or not they can have you as a teacher's aide in their classroom or not, they'd definitely be able to um, talk to you. And it definitely goes that, you know, um, I know for my part, I am. So if anyone has questions about working for Maj, feel free to email me afterwards. Or if you want to set up a, a Zoom talk or a phone call, I'm happy to do that as well. Thank you so much, Mrs. Guernsey. All right, Mr. Anderson, um, I know Mr. Sebastian had mentioned that you were a private tutor as well. I know we didn't get much time to talk about that today, but I was wondering if you had any advice for those who are interested in teaching either for like middle school students or the Montessori method or in being a private tutor as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, I think, uh, I think a love of teaching stems from a love of learning. And uh, I think once you really love being a student um, if you love learning and you love a particular subject then learn as much you can about it get enthusiastic about it and that'll just become become contagious and you'll just want to you'll want to share it you want to teach it um that's kind of what happened for me when uh i was when i was in high school uh i was uh i was I guess i was a junior and uh and i had helped my siblings a lot i have four younger siblings and uh, or sorry, three younger siblings and one older sibling. Um, and I would, I would teach them all the time, help them out with their school. But then um, my neighbor had uh, 17 kids and they asked if I could come help teach over there. And that's how I, I got into teaching was a junior year of high school was just tutoring, tutoring them because I just, I loved learning so much and, and I wanted to, to share it. And I think that's, that's ultimately the best thing that you can do right now, especially when your job is to be a student is to, uh, is to, is to learn as much as you can and get enthusiastic about it because that's what's going to be uh, that's going to be that enthusiasm is what you're going to uh, kind of share in the classroom once you become a teacher. Thank you so much, Mr. Anderson. Um, and last but certainly not least, uh, Ms. Yanishek, what are some tips you would give to those who are interested in majoring in psychology or who want to bring the Catholic faith into the counseling field as well? Yeah, so I didn't do an undergrad in psychology, so I have more of the experience of um, the grad program, but one of the things that's helped me and that the professors emphasize a lot is self-care, and because burnout is so easy in this profession, 
So I think building some good self care habits, like having a good spiritual life, I definitely notice I do a lot better when I'm praying and when I'm taking care of myself physically. Um, so I think getting started on those kinds of habits early is a good thing to do for this profession. Um, and then what else? I think there are some, like noticing whether you have certain gifts, I think can be a good indicator that you might be a good fit in the field. So of course, having the capacity to listen and not get bored is pretty important. Um, I think also a love of learning is really good because we do have to do like um, continuing education units um, once you're in the field. And um, they also talk about how humility is like the essential virtue of the profession. And um, that's everybody's favorite virtue to practice, but um, kind of having, yeah, like a, a capacity to listen and to receive others and um, noticing the gifts that you have and how those might fit with the field, I think are good things to kind of pay attention to. Thank you so much for that. And thank you all so much for coming again. I'm gonna to toss it back over to Mr. Sebastian for the last few minutes here. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you to all of our incredible panelists. Your passion and wisdom is uh, truly appreciated and shines through. And I know is uh, inspirational for me as well as our, our students as well. I've got a few questions. I'll try to get as many as we can and get you, get you all out of here uh, right on the hour. Um, I will start off asking this question of Mr. Anderson. Uh, so you have taught high schoolers and elementary middle school students. What are some of the differences that you've noticed and pros and cons to both in your experience? Oh, uh, man. Uh, There's a lot well, to say there, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, imagine, imagine yourself as a high schooler, which you are now, which is easy. And then imagine yourself how you were six years ago. And now imagine teaching yourself now and imagine teaching yourself then. And that's kind of kind of what you'll find is the, the best way to like imagine what it's like to teach both. Um, the, I mean, I'm sure you've noticed in the past six years since you were a middle schooler that um, there's been some changes and that your your temperament has changed your, and um, and things like that. And uh, and uh, and obviously with that comes differences in you know how to approach this how to approach a subject so um i don't know i think that's that's probably the, the best way to imagine teaching yeah. middle school versus high school that's amazing i love that and I, i'm starting to think about this with my own children too <laughs> i mean, my my oldest is five and a half six and you even see in the course of a year a lot of change six years oof that's that's a lot uh, thank you. Uh, so for our panelists who are mothers, how is it for you to balance your job with your children? Uh, Mrs. Grins, you already mentioned this. If you have anything else, feel free to chime in, but I will address this to Mrs. Michael. How is that, that job life balance for you? Yeah. Um, unfortunately I don't have a baby with me today. Um, we lucked out, uh, his, his aunt's in town. So she wanted some, oh. some time. So auntie stole baby. Uh, but Maybe Ambrose is so cute next time. <laughs> <laughs> next time. Yeah, for me, I'm in a, a, a lucky situation where being the principal, I'm not working directly with kids uh, all day long. I'm not monitoring children in a classroom. Um, my job is more of guiding the school, um, kind of being the, the buffer between teachers and parents, um, helping to clear the path so that the teachers can truly take their classroom and own it. Um, so that's my role, uh, which means a lot of office time, a lot of desk time, a lot of um, walking around the campus and checking in with people. Hey, how are you? Popping into the teacher's lounge. Um, how's everybody doing? You know, keeping everybody in a good spirit, moving forward and always working towards uh, the good, the true, and beautiful. Um, and that's something I can do with a baby on my hip. So I've learned that this year, uh, baby Ambrose is almost six months old. And you can see behind me, I've got some lovely baby toys tucked in the corner of my office, uh, little bouncers. I've got one that attaches to the doorway and he can bounce around, but also I can hold him in a baby carrier, put him in the stroller. Um, I have a, a one-handed baby feeding bottle so that I can feed him and answer emails at the same time or take a phone call. 
Uh, so it's, it's truly a blessing to be able to have him here while I'm working. What I've also found is what a joy he's able to bring, not just to me, uh, but to my community in general. He's got uh, you know, 170 siblings here at school. I bring him out at recess and I hear, baby Ambrose is here and the flocks come running. Um, so being able, and you know, parents see him. And at first I thought, was that gonna be a problem? Was I gonna have parents saying, you're not doing a good enough job because you're distracted by your child. And in fact, we've had the complete opposite. I've had parents come and say, wow, we really love seeing the pro-life spirit at work here. We love seeing your baby here. We love that our kids are able to be here at school and see a little baby brother, see their, their little friend. Um, and that's been a real growing experience for our, uh, our school in general. And it's, continued that vision of we as a school are a family and uh so that's been a true blessing for us here that's amazing thank you so much that's that's awesome uh to miss janishek uh as a therapist uh do you do you find in your experience or have you heard it talked about in the industry you were mentioning burnout a lot before is it easy to become overwhelmed or burdened by what uh, your clients are speaking to you about? And how would you combat that if you are considering going into the industry? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think that's where, again, kind of like the being Catholic is very helpful because um, I think it both gives me a lens to see like hope and virtue and good goodness more clearly. And then also, um, like I can pray for clients, like if it's weighing on me, like it's a comfort to be able to just pray for the client or um, what else? There's something else that came to mind. Yeah, I think acknowledging the freedom of the other person as well, that like I can't control what they're doing and I can't save them and that's not my role. <laughs> and it's, um, yeah, their own freedom. And that's again, comes back to just our Catholic perspective. So I think, yeah, I think that's a huge support for me. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And it's also an interesting correlation between teaching and, and therapy as well. You do have to acknowledge the individual of your students. Um, as much as you want to lead them on the path to virtue, lead them on the path to health, lead them on the path to wisdom and knowledge, uh, you are still working with a person who has free will on the other side of things. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Uh, so to, for Dr. Sullivan, I know we're getting close here, and we've had a few people who have asked questions about how do you know what to spe specialize in? Uh, how do you prepare for a specialization, especially if you are considering not only a college major in a particular field, uh, but maybe a master's or a PhD, as in your case, and now teaching it in college as well? How did you prepare and choose the field that you wanted to go into? Yeah, great question. And it really boils down to what's been said before of you having a love, having a love for learning, having a love for learning a particular era. And for me, you know, it's just, I love these certain kinds of works, the Jane Austen Dickens Victorian era kind of works. Um, and so I'm wanting to pursue that, but also with any type of education and any type of experience, that you gain, you recognize you want to develop, be aware of and develop already your um, gifts and talents that you've been discovering you have and the desires of certain fields that, or areas that you want to learn more about, but also recognizing God's going to place you somewhere that you're not prepared for. And maybe the major you're thinking of, all of a sudden you'll take a class and you're going to 180 and turn around. And then so having that prayerful confidence in providence of realizing I've got desires, I want to pursue them, go for it, but I'm going to get turned around and being willing to adapt is, is just wonderful. Um, and, and just the brief example is, so I, I studied 19th century British literature and I'm teaching the Iliad and the Odyssey and I love it. <laughs> so, um, so anyways, but I'm also teaching 19th century British too, but point being of, of just follow, follow and develop what God's given you of those desires and just like 
have that courage and excitement to know that uh, he's going to throw something totally new in your path and, and great. That was awesome. Well, that's a, that's a perfect way to wrap it up. I think um, I know we've got a lot of other questions and we thank you guys so much for, for your attention and your, your thoughtfulness. Um, Susanna, do you want to wrap us up with a prayer? Sure. Thank you. You are the father and of the son and of the Holy spirit. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Mother of divine grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thank you all so much. God bless you. And uh, happy Ash Wednesday next week. <laughs> Penitential Ash Wednesday. All right. God bless you all. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye.